everybody. Welcome to Central Baptist Church. Glad you're able to be here on a Wednesday. I would say happy Wednesday night, but it's about 95 degrees outside. It doesn't feel like nighttime at all. But we have air conditioner in here, so this is kind of where you want to be. So I was glad when they said it's me. Let us go into the house of the Lord where there's air conditioning. So glad about that. Now let's go ahead and stand up, if you would, with me and open up our songbooks. We'll go ahead and get started with number 472. Number 472, we'll sing Follow On. Let's go ahead and sing all three verses. Is it on? I don't know. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go Where the clouds are blooming and the sweet waters flow Everywhere He leads me I would follow, follow on Walking in His footsteps till the crown be Looking forward to a good service this evening. We're just excited about you being here, and I'm glad I'm here. Amen. So uh, the guys are getting the uh, prayer list printed out, and we'll, Daniel's going to come tonight. He's going to be doing the prayer list for us in a little bit. Um, he's preaching 15 minutes, and I'm preaching 15 minutes, okay? So we'll get to that in just a little bit here. All right. Uh, Announcement-wise, we have next Tuesday night visitation. Matter of fact, the next two Tuesday nights, I think it is, right, Daniel? Uh, 17th and the 24th. Uh, visitation here at the church at 645. Invite you to come and go with us. And we have several folks that we've been reaching back to out uh, to uh, touch them. Uh, this uh, from the Vacation Bible School. And so we had a wonderful Vacation Bible School. I'm, I'm almost kind of, feels kind of empty up here, you know. When you look around here, it's all gone. But that's okay. Uh, next year, Lord willing, for Vacation Bible School. So, um, this, um, I tell you what, Daniel, why don't we go ahead and sing? Okay. He and I are going to sing a song for you tonight. Uh, one the choir already knows, and uh, let's see, where's Sandy? Where's Al? Is he here? He's back in the back? Okay, we'll just go ahead and do it then. We'll get him another time. Okay, let's do that. Okay, am I doing this one? Sure. <laughs> I told all my troubles goodbye, goodbye to each dear and each sigh. This world where I roam cannot be my home, I'm bound for a land in the sky. I walk and I talk with my Lord, I feast every day on His word. Heaven is there and I can say goodbye world, goodbye. Now don't you weep for me when I'm gone, cause I won't have to leave here alone. And when I hear that last trumpet sound, my feet won't stay on the ground. Gonna rise with a shout, gonna fly, gonna ride 
with my Lord through the sky. Heaven is near and I can say here, goodbye world, goodbye. Amy, stop. Brother Al, do you love Jesus? Do you? You know this song. Well, come on, sing it with us. We're going to sing the second verse. And we do that last ending, we'll repeat the last phrase slower. Goodbye. Okay. <laughs> Amen. All right. I think the guys are passing out the prayer list there. Daniel's going to come, and if you see if you have any prayer list requests that you'd like to add to the, the list, and we'll have time of prayer in a little while. Right. Yeah, I need a copy too. All right. Well, we have our prayer list, and those of you are getting it right now. And uh, let's go ahead and look that over. Make sure you have your prayer requests that you'd like your church family to pray about. And if you want to add anything that is not on this list, if you didn't get an opportunity to write it down, then I'd like to add this to this list so we can be praying about it. So, Miss Jessie. Yeah, he has, uh, it is going to be a little bit of recovery. Nate. Exactly. So, um, if y'all didn't know, Jesse is going up to Washington to, to, uh, be up there. Yeah. Uh, Jesse's going to be up there to be with, uh, her dad for about a week, week and a half. So y'all pray for a safe trip. Um, pray for us. We're going up to D.C. to get her on the plane. That's like a three-hour drive. And uh, it's a really awesome price on the plane tickets, and it's a straight shot from D.C. to Seattle. So a little less than six hours in the air. But we'll be on the ground for six hours driving, uh, taking her up there and then coming back. So pray for both, uh, both sets of transportation there. All right, who else? Ready on the left? Left is ready? All right. Pray for the baby, of course. It's the imminent baby. <laughs> Pray for Jackie. Now, she's not on there, but she does need it. She's running around here trying to repaint and rebuild the church. So, <laughs> Yes, Al. Okay. 
Okay, Ryan Brown, nephew. Recovery. All right, on the right. We'll just go with Miss Katie. Yeah. yeah, she had her hand up first. Yeah, praying for the coronavirus to stop. Absolutely. Yes, Crystal. Okay, so, yep, I'm praying for the twins' mom, too. Uh, what's her name? Melissa. Melissa? Okay. Okay, anyone else? It's Don. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely trying to keep the energy up after, you know, baby just arriving. So. And teaching. All right, anyone else? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the Pruitt was your friend that lost her dad? Okay. JoJo. Uh-huh. Praying. Praying for Rob. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we got a neighbor friend named Rob. He needs to get saved. So he's about 12 years old. And he comes by every now and then, so praying for him to get saved. Okay. Hey, Tristan. Okay. Crew, I think I met Crew before. Crew wants to go to church. Great thing about that situation is you can witness to those kids and those kids will get saved and Christ will end up living through those kids and that'll be a testimony of their parents in the house. So it's a awesome thing how God does to get work like that. All right, anyone else? Right is ready. All right, Eric. Stand for freedom. Know what your rights are. Be able to stand up for them. All right. You have another one? Thankful you're saved. Amen. That is a praise right there. Hey, we can have praises too. It's okay. You know, I still have a praise for Vacation Bible School. We got four kids saved. All right. That's four kids saved, and we had a good crowd here. And I'm, I'm, I'm still excited about it. I'm still thankful. Just put together the DVD with a little video on it. We're going to drop off to some of our Vacation Bible School families. So I'm going to do that uh, throughout the rest of the week. All right. No one else? All right. I guess we can go ahead and pull up our songbooks again. There we go. All right, let's turn to number 479. Y'all go ahead and stand up with me, and hey, we'll go ahead and have the offering um, after this song. So 479, I am resolved. We'll sing the first, the third, and the 
last verse, first, the third, and the last verse. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord my side. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad. offering and we'll take it up. All right, we're going to Acts chapter number 6. Acts chapter number 6. Now, I'm going to speak rather fast tonight. Um, using one of the Bible stories Brother Daniel used with the young people in Vacation Bible School last week, we're going to try to go over just um, thoughts on the, 
Well, what happened to Stephen, the first deacon, one of the first deacons that were chosen? And see what God did in his life. And then I'm going to get you to think with me. Put your thinking caps on. And I want you to think what is, I'm going to give you three points tonight, very simply, 15-minute message, okay? I'm going to go as fast as I can because I have a lot of verses I want to read tonight in this passage. It's dealing with the trial and the martyr of Stephen. And uh, so as we do so, I want you to think, what is the common denominator? The co- don't, don't say it out loud, just think to yourself. And in the end, I'll ask you, what is that common denominator in the life of Stephen and what's taking place uh, with him getting called to be a deacon and also to uh, go through his trial and then, of course, martyrdom. Okay? Look at chapter 6 and verse number 1. We're dealing with the trial and martyrdom of, of this great man of God. All right? It says, And in those days when the number of his disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Uh, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So there's seven of them. And whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, uh, first point, simply tonight, in chapter 6, verses 1 through, well, let's read down to verse 8. Steve, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit to serve, to be a servant. Um, now we find in this passage they were having difficulties between the Grecian widows and the Hebrew women, widows, and uh, they were, some were not getting served the way they needed to be served. And the disciples, the 12 disciples, the 11 disciples actually were the ones who were trying to serve uh, <coughs> and were trying to do what they could to help out with all of this. And they said, no, it's not right for us. We need to be praying more. We need to be reading the scriptures and studying and be able to minister to you. And now I need some help. And so would they, they said, would you look out seven men? And they did so. And these guys were, were servants. And that's what the word deacon means. It means servant. The key here we're looking at is that he was filled with the Spirit of God to serve. He was a good man. Verse number three says he was a man of honest report. Uh, he was a good man. He was a godly man. Uh, he was... Uh, filled with the Holy Ghost and filled with the wisdom that God had. He was full of faith. Drop down to verse number 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith. So he was not only filled with the Spirit of God and wisdom, he was filled with faith to do this job that God had called uh, them to do. Uh, He was a gifted man. Verse number 8. He did great wonders and miracles among the people. So a lot of things in his life. But the main key here is that Stephen was a servant. If we could ever grasp the reality of what it means to be a servant of the Lord and to be a a servant with a humble heart, that that we we are here to serve the Lord God. We're placed on this earth to to first trust in Him as our Savior, but as to have that relationship with Him and to, to serve the Lord our God. We have so many Christians today don't like to serve. Uh, they'd rather have someone else do the serving. I thought this was a pretty good illustration. How many of you remember evangelist uh, Tom Farrell, Dr. Tom Farrell? Several of you did. Dr. Farrell used to preach down here at Maranatha several times in revival meetings. He preached over at my home church, Good News Baptist, many times. Many folks come to know the Lord. Dr. Farrell was scheduled to preach at one of the teen camps at the camp this year. But Dr. Farrell had a brain tumor. And Dr. Farrell passed away just a few weeks ago into the presence of the Lord. Well, this is one of his illustrations, and I thought it's kind of apropos, and I liked it. How many, are, how many of you are probably near my age? I'm 58, be 59 in September, Lord willing. And you remember back in the 60s, was it 1967? 
I was five years of age, and I remember it was summertime, and my dad and mom had taken us down to Charles, North Charleston, South Carolina. That sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? And we had a great aunt down there, and we were going to visit her and her husband, and we were just enjoying ourselves. And my dad went out, and he bought a little miniature um, NASA um, astronaut's shuttle for the one to landing on the moon in 1967. Okay? Well, this little illustration is from 1971 when Apollo 15 landed on the moon. I thought this was really good. Dr. Farrell used to use this. July, from July 26 through August the 7th, 1971, the eyes of millions of Americans were on the Apollo 15 moon mission. You may remember the astronauts David Scott and James Irwin, who landed on the moon and spent 18 of their 36 hours there outside the spacecraft. 18 hours on the land. Okay? They covered over 17 miles of the surface in a specialized vehicle people dubbed the moon buggy. You remember that thing? I remember that. Upon returning to Earth, James Irwin, he was a Christian. And as they were on their trip back to the Earth, he said, As I was returning, I realized that I'm not a celebrity, but I'm a servant. So I am here as God's servant on planet Earth to share what I have experienced that others may know the glory of God. What's that, uh, was Neil Armstrong, first one? We just got a road change down here, Neil Armstrong Parkway. By the way, what's the difference between a parkway and a road? My wife and I were talking about that the other day. What's the difference between a parkway and a road? I don't know. <laughs> makes sense. Around here it does make sense. Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, parkway is what you drive on or driveway what you park on. Okay. Got it. Um, and he said, to show the glory of God. Every one of us need to have a servant's heart. Stephen had that servant's heart. And I think that's, that's not the main key, what I'm driving at tonight. But I think that was one of the keys in his life, that he had a heart to serve. And we need that too. Look at verse number 9 as we go down further. Then there becomes a debate about the truth. Um, and that's the way the devil likes to work. When disciples are multiplied in verse number 7, great wonders and miracles are done in verse 8. Um, things are great are happening, you know. Uh, and then he says, but then there comes a debate. And then there arose, verse 9, the certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the, of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom. Notice another character. We, we already saw that up in verse number 3. And the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemies. Okay, they brought up lies against him. Uh, verse 13, and they set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place. Talking about the temple and the law. For we have heard him say, this, this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Look at how he mirrors Jesus Christ. Watch because uh, the things that Jesus went through sometimes, the struggles and the persecutions we go through, as we take our stand for Jesus Christ. All right? And if we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. Remember, Jesus said he would destroy the temple, but he meant the temple of his body. And shall change the customs which Moses delivered us and all that sat in the council looking, notice this next phrase, looking steadfastly on him, on Stephen, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. I think that's so neat. You know, God will always come through when there's a debate about the truth. He will stand for His truth, and you'll have men and women who will stand for the truth of God's Word. And God, God will uh, be there for you, and He'll be with you. And His face shined, as it were, the face of an angel. Then from verse number 1 all the way down, we're, we don't have time. I'm, I wish we had a little more time. But as you look through the Scriptures, you take time to look at what G, uh, Stephen preaches. He goes into preaching. Men and brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. So he deals with the heritage of the Jews in verses 1 through 8. If you want a little outline, we'll give a little outline tonight. He deals with the hardness of the Jews 
in chapter, uh, there in the chapter in verse 9 down through verse 41, all those verses deal with how the Jews were hard against God, uh, how God punished them. Uh, you go down further, he come over to verse 41, and you get into more of the history of the Jews. So he's detailing the history of the Jews. Now he's doing it all with a purpose. He's laying out who Jesus Christ is and what has done and how the Jews have always rebelled against God. And it's becoming convicting to these scribes, these Pharisees, and, and so forth, the religious crowd that he's, that he's preaching to. Uh, you go down a little further, and verse number 46, he gives more of what's going to take place. Uh, who found favor before God, desired to find a tabernacle for God of da Jacob, that's David. Solomon built a house, howbeit the Most High dwelleth in temp not in temples made with hands, said the prophet. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Now remember, what was one of the accusations we just heard in earlier in chapter 6? Well, he said that Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth is going to tear down the temple. We know, as we said, Jesus meant his body. Isn't it strange? He's correcting this, and he comes back to this. He says, heaven is God's throne. Earth is God's footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? And then we get into the hearing of conviction. And the Jews are convicted. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. We dealt with the filling with the Spirit of God to serve. Now we're dealing with the filling of the Spirit of God to speak. There are going to be times in your life where you're going to have to speak up for Christ. And you're going to need some help. And you're not going to be able to do it on your own. And you're going to have to have the Lord's help in this. Okay? All right, go down a little further. He, he's really put, you talk about hard, convicting words. Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your father did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which, which showed before the coming of the, capital J, just, capital O, one. Jesus, the Messiah. Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. These guys are getting ready to pass judgment on him and murder him. And there's, he's, he's saying, no, you're the guys that murdered Jesus. I don't think these folks like this, you know. Verse 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it? You got the law and you think you're living by the law, but you haven't even kept the law. Talk about some hard preaching. Look at the results. He suffered voluntarily, and went, but he did it under God's power and the power of the Holy Spirit. He suffered he says there in verse number 54, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. We mentioned that this past Sunday. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon them. You know, you could stop your ears all, all, every time you hear preaching, but if God is dealing with your heart and convicting you through the preaching of God's Word, it's hard to run from it. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. Who did we preach on just recently on Wednesday night? Saul and his conversion, he became a new man. Well, look where it started. Who do you think heard the entire message? Saul did. Look at what takes place. He heard the entire message and he cast him out. Okay, verse uh, 59, They stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And we had said this, as the term goes for believers, he fell asleep. You know, that's never said about the lost. You ever go to a graveyard and see on a, a tombstone where it says, asleep in Jesus? That's a scriptural principle. I used to didn't like it. I didn't like the thought, asleep in Jesus. I want to, when I go to heaven, I want to run around. I want to be active, you know. I don't want to be asleep in Jesus. 
1 Thessalonians talks about those who are asleep in Christ and how we will not precede those who are in the ground. Uh, scriptures teach about that. Brian and I were talking about that today. Um, but we are, through this, look at what takes place. <sighs> Sometimes God brings the greatest joy through the hardest parts of suffering. In the Bible, human sorrow is the hardest, but God's power is the most compassionate when we go through the hardest of struggles. Mercy meets misery. And God sent mercy. And what took place? Stephen passes on asleep in the hands of Jesus as he stands there at the Father's right hand and receives his dear saint gladly. And then what takes place? As we read further into chapter 9, Saul, under heavy conviction, it's hard for thee to kick against the prick, Saul. Saul gets saved, and the gospel spreads even further. Stephen's victory led to Saul's salvation. It was a victory. And the world, God often has to dig the wells of joy with a spade or the shovel of sorrow. He suffered voluntarily and he suffered victoriously. He cried out, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Just like his Savior. Amen. Amen. What's the common denominator? I said I'd ask you, what's the common denominator for the three points? Serving, speaking, and suffering. What's the common denominator with Stephen tonight? Three times you'll find where those three points were located, a two words together, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help you serve. The Holy Spirit will help you speak. And the Holy Spirit will also help you when you suffer. Amen? Amen. Amen. Something to help us along the way. God's Spirit is there and it will help us all along the way, no matter what we do. Okay, Daniel's going to come back with another song, and, and he's going to speak, and I think we're going to do prayer time right at the end, okay? Yeah, all right.
know, think about that song. Uh, could you call yourself happy in that moment with Stephen? If you were in Stephen's shoes, could you call yourself happy? I want you to think about that. I'll put this little mic on. That's one of those things that the world looks at Christians and it's like, all right, these guys are weird. They, uh, they consider all this stuff, suffering, misery, they consider that joy. All right? And the world calls that weird. All right. Woo. All right. Cool. There we go. I'll turn that off. Now this is on. I'm not learning. The, yeah, there's the furry thing. I'm not worried about it. I'm not even sure that helps. <laughs> anyway, you'll think about that. Think about Stephen. He is about to get hit in the head by rocks. He's about to get bludgeoned. And all of a sudden, he looks up and sees the Savior. And he sees Jesus. And not only does he see Jesus, Jesus is probably looking down on him, waiting for him to walk over to see him. Now, only in a relationship with Christ can you have something that is seemingly so awful become the happiest moment in your life. And that's when you choose, uh, that's a result of you choosing to live for him. That's a result of you choosing to be separated from the world and separated unto Christ. And only then can Christ shine through you like Christ did through Stephen. That was an awesome, awesome message. Thank you, Pastor. That was a great story. Stephen I don't imagine that there could have been another guy that could have gotten through to Paul. God used everything that Stephen had, and then he added God on top of that, and, Stephen, and Paul got saved. It's amazing how the gospel works. Well, we're not going to talk about that, but Stephen was something that we call separated unto Christ, and that's what we're going to talk about. That is truly what the desire of a Christian is. Um, I have one thing to show you that disappeared, and... It is somewhere. I'll show you all after we're done. All right. We're going to go ahead and start. Anyway, I have 15 minutes. So the desire of a Christian. If y'all could turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And that's where we're going to be for the next 15 minutes. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We may go to a couple of different places. But Stephen definitely had this desire fulfilled. He desired to be separate to Christ. He desired to be set apart, and set apart and separate are the same thing. If you are set apart to something, you're separate from something else, and that's the only way that works, okay? That really is, and we're going to see how that is in Scripture. You have to be set apart to Christ if you want Christ to work through you. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time you've given us. Lord, I just want to praise you for your goodness. I want to praise you for your salvation, praise you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for that wonderful gift, the Comforter. And Lord, please help your words be the words to be spoken and not mine. I love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to look at the first nine verses here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Y'all look on with me. I'll read. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given, us the, given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are present from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. So the desire of a Christian, that's what we're going to talk about, being separated. The results of separation, what exactly is separation? In Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, it starts off talking about Paul. And Paul says that he was separated unto the gospel of Christ. Now we look here in the book of Acts, in Acts 13 verse 2, 
And the Holy Spirit is instructing the church at Antioch there to separate me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So separation means I am separate from something to something. You cannot be separate from something and be sitting there in the middle. That's impossible. There is no middle road. There is no sitting on the fence. You cannot leave the world and not go towards God. If you don't go towards God, you'll fall back where you came from. You're not truly separate. But that's the only way to identify a Christian is our separation from and unto Christ. From the world and unto Christ. That's the only way that Christ can work through you. Separation from the world and unto Christ. Doesn't that seem like a good thing to be closer to the one who saved you? That does. That encourages me so that I can be closer to the one who saved me. I can be closer to my heavenly father and I can have better communication, but I need to get rid of all the stuff that he doesn't like. And when I get rid of all the stuff that he doesn't like, I need to add the stuff that he does like. Separate from, separated unto. And that's what we're getting at tonight. We think back at Stephen. Stephen was definitely separated from, he was separated from all that ideology. He was separated from all the Greek theology going on. He was separated from all the pagan behaviors and pagan culture. He was separated from the Romans. He was separated from everything. He was separated unto the gospel. And he was not afraid to stand up for the gospel because he was separated from everything that was opposed to the gospel. Now, when he decided to stand up for the gospel, God said, okay, I'm going to help him out. And like pastor was talking about, God does help you out. When you need to stand up for something, Christ will come and give you the words and he'll give you the power to do so. You may seem like a meek, wilting flower, but when you are separating yourself unto Christ, it doesn't matter who you are. If you let God take control of you, you will get up and say those words you need to say. You will act the way that you need to act. That is separation unto Christ. Now, why don't we see more Christians doing Christian things out there? Because they're not separated from the world. They may say, yeah, I'm separate. I don't do that stuff. I don't drink. I don't. But how much of your life is separated unto Christ? That's where we get the put off to put on. You can't just put off. That doesn't work. You can't do that. You have to put off and then replace all that stuff with living for Christ. And you can look up the fruits of the Spirit. You can look up the, the works of the flesh. And you can look up that on your own and see exactly what um, the Bible is talking about there. But we're going to get into what it's talking about here with the, with the Corinthian church. Now, they had a problem with separation. If you look at where they're from, they are in a major crossroads of the world. Every single ideological or every single, every single thought of idolatry, that's, I was trying to think of a big word to say that, but all the idolatry in the world focused on this place, this trades crossroads where Corinth was. They were just soaking it up. They were rich. They got money from all this stuff. Money was coming in from all over the place. And they soaked it all up. Well, when you soak it all up, there's no room for God to enter into you. What is separation? Romans 8, 39 says, we cannot be separated from the love of God. That is great. God has his separate, or God has his love of God on you. You cannot be separated from that. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about you losing your salvation or anything like that. We're talking about God being able to work through you. And you being able to identify with God and not with the world systems. So every Christian that is saved has the earnest expectation of heaven. From what this passage talks about, we desire that we're not going to be in the flesh anymore. We're going to be with God. We look at some of these verses that I will hear in a second. And man, it's going to be great when we put this body off and we're truly separated from all of the world. And now we're with Christ. Just like Stephen was, he was separated from all the world. And now he's standing with Jesus, and he's there even now. And that's where we're going to be one day, as long as you have Jesus as your Savior. Let's look at this. God has a promise to you. He has a perfect body waiting for you. And some people are waiting. I'm like, oh, man, I can't wait for this. No more achy knees, no more anything like that. He has a new home waiting for you, like we heard about this in this passage. He has a new home. There's no suffering waiting for you. 
There's no sin waiting for you in heaven. No telemarketer is going to call you in heaven. It's going to be a good time. That's the result of God's love holding you, and you cannot be separated from that love. That's God's work. Our work is showing that love through our life, being separated unto Christ and separated from the world. So let's figure out how to get there. Look at verse 4. It says, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Talking about this flesh that we live in right now. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Why do we groan? Because we are being burdened. Sin in your life and sin in other people's lives is a burden. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to bear each other's burdens, but we have our own burdens that we are supposed to bear as well. Whether they're physical burdens, emotional burdens, spiritual burdens, we groan because we have these burdens. We're burdened. That's what this says. And we have a desire that we would not be unclothed, but clothed upon. And what would we be clothed with? That mortality might be swallowed up of life. We want Christ to envelop us with his grace. We want to be more like Christ, and eventually we just want to be up in heaven. Our bodies are groaning, our lives are groaning, we have sin all around us. And we want to be more like Christ. That's a reason why we have to be separated. We have these groanings in our lives right now. How best to take care of those groanings, those burdens, than to get close to the one who has the power to help you with it. That is a goal of separation right there. We desire to be rid of this flesh and everything that comes with it. You ever tried to subscribe to cable? I mean, you might have like three or four channels that you want. But what happens to the other 175 channels in the package that you cannot pare down? That's like life. All right? You have the good things, but you also have the bad things. You have the sin, you have the bumps, you have the bruises, you have the heartaches. Everything comes with it. That's the burdens that we have in our lives. But the closer you are to Christ, the more Christ can shine through and help you with those burdens. There is a reason why we should be separated from the world, replacing what the world wants us to do with what Christ wants us to do. God puts it in our power. I want you to listen to this. He puts it in our power to depend on His power. He gives you the choice to depend on His power. It's your choice whether to be separated or not. It's your choice whether to do the things the world wants you to do or not. Christ made the choice to save you. You said, okay, save me. And now we're not going to be separated from his love. It says that in Romans chapter 8. But how close are you going to get to him? It's your choice. He puts it in your power to depend on his power. I would rather have Christ help me every day with my burdens. And as Christ is helping me every day with my burdens, I can help others with their burdens. But I can only do it as Christ fills me with his power. I want you to look at verse 5. We're going to read a few more verses now. It says, Now he that wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us, or given unto us, the earnest of the Spirit. When it says the earnest of the Spirit, that's everything that you need of the Holy Spirit. When you got saved, you got every bit of the Holy Spirit that you ever did need. You just need to separate yourself unto that Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I want you to be careful with something. Comfort. Laxadaisicalness. Look at verse 6 again. It says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing whilst we are at home in the body. We're at home. We're comfort. Kicking our feet up. Waking up when we want to, turning on the game, sitting down with a cup of coffee, bag of popcorn, some Cheetos, piece of chocolate cake, some donuts, whatever you want, not doing anything except for what we want to do. We're comfortable. It says, while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, I don't believe that saying while we're on earth, we are absent from the Lord because the Lord is with you right now. You cannot be absent from the Lord when you're saved because the Lord is living in you right now. But when we're comfortable and kicking back and doing our own thing and not doing the things that Christ wants us to do, we're absent. You're playing hooky from being a Christian. You're not separating yourself unto Christ. Now, you may not be at the bar. 
You may not be in places that you don't need to be. You may not be gambling. You may not be betting. You may not be doing all these other things. But when you're sitting back and doing nothing, you're certainly not separating yourself unto Christ. You're comfortable. You're at home in your flesh, at home in your sin. Comfortable. Look what it says. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. When you're absent from all that stuff, when you put that away, when you put your desires away, and like Paul said, I die daily. And why is that? He wants Christ to live inside him and live through him and shine out of him. And he wants, you to, do, he wants to do that through all of your lives. He wants to do that through my life. When we're absent from that, when we're absent from the body, when we're putting to death the desires of the flesh, and we replace it with what Christ wants us to do, he will work through you. You'll get your prayers answered. You will see God working through you in marvelous ways. Like Paul getting saved. Because I think that looking at Stephen, Stephen didn't try to kick back and become comfortable. He looked at those people who had the power to put him to death, pointed right in their eyeballs, and gave him the word of God. Not caring what was going to happen to him. He was separated unto Christ. Separated from his desires of self-preservation, of cowardice, of wanting to live a nice, normal, calm life, no confrontation to, I have to speak up for my Lord. That is being separated unto Christ. And you see what kind of power that Christ did through Stephen's life. Even though his life ended, it didn't really end. It just began that day. He's up in heaven right now. But because of that, Paul's up in heaven right now. And because of that, we have a majority of the books in the New Testament written right now. And because of that, millions of more people are saved because of that ministry, because of what Stephen decided to stand up for and separate himself from. That is why separation is so important. That is why separation from the world and separation unto Christ is so important in a Christian's life. Look at verse 9. It says, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. We've got to lead our life that's going to be pleasing to Christ. We have to lead a life that Christ is going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I think that when Stephen entered up into heaven, that was what he heard. You remember the parable that Jesus told of the servants that the master gave the talents to and Well, they came back and they doubled the talents and said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And then Stephen, Stephen came up. You know the good thing? He didn't have any bruises on him. Stephen didn't have any marks on him. He didn't have any black eyes. He didn't have any crushed in skulls or anything like that. Whatever happened to his fleshly body, he didn't have that anymore. He was up in heaven and Christ enfolded him in his arms and he said, well done. I want that. Do you want that? I want that. How do we do it? Look here in verse 14. For the love of Christ. And that's how we do it. It says here, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which should live, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We do it through the love of God. We do it through God's power. We can't do it through what we want to do. We can't do it through our own righteous indignation. We can't do it through the sheer power of someone's anger like so many cartoons and all that stuff would say. You ever seen the Incredible Hulk? In that cartoon, you couldn't beat him because when you made him mad, he would just get stronger. But you know what that is? That's a cartoon. That is not real life. When we get madder and madder and madder, we get further from the truth. We get further from the love of Christ. And that is where the real power comes in. If you look at what happened with Stephen, Stephen, his face was glowing. If you look at the first part of his testimony when that started in front of, those, in front of the high priest, in front of all those people in charge, his face was glowing. He had the love of Christ shining through him. And he looked at them not because he wanted to be angry, not because he wanted to be mean, 
He looked at them and didn't want to point out all of their wrongdoings because he thought that he was better than they were. He wanted to show Christ's love. You know, Christian, I dare say that the reason why you tell someone that they need to be saved is because you love them. Am I right? You'd rather not see them die and go to hell. An example of Christ's love was reaching out to those people who were unloved, reaching out to those people who needed love, reaching out to those people who wanted it. An example of hate would be to neglect that. Stephen was an example of Christ's love. He did everything through Christ's love. He showed them what the gospel was. Yes, he pointed out that they were wrong because you have to understand that you're a sinner to get saved. He pointed that out, but he also showed them the great love. If you look at the history lesson that he gave them, he showed them every step of the way, the great love that Christ has showed them for thousands of years before they got to that point. He was trying to convince them how much God loved them by leading them through the Red Sea, by bringing them to the Promised Land, by destroying all those nations. You remember Caleb went up and he got that mountain when he was 80 years old. Nothing but Christ's love. And Stephen was reminding them of all that. He was reminding them that Christ loved them so much they needed to get saved and Christ was going to save them. He was reminding them of Christ's love in that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. He reminded them of Christ coming to earth and Christ dying. He reminded them that they were sinners. He reminded them that they needed a Savior. If you want to see someone that was truly separated, he was separated unto Christ. And he was living in the power of Christ's love. Look down at verse 16 and 17. God wants us to be eternally focused. He doesn't want us to be focused on anything the world has to offer. He doesn't want us to be focused on any of that. He wants us to be eternally focused. We are made new creatures right there. It's one of my favorite verses in verse number 17. We're made new creatures, just like Christ, passed from death unto life. Here in this chapter, it talks about we don't know Christ by the flesh anymore. We know him by the spirit. He has the same as we have entered into death and raised again in newness of life. That's how we should be focused. Stephen was focused on the eternal. He was focused on the high priest's soul. He was focused on Paul's soul. Just like what we should be doing, we should be focused on others' souls around us. I'm going to have to come back and finish this later, Pastor. I'm about halfway done. So, <laughs> so we'll come back at another time and uh, try to finish this. But we'll go ahead and we'll pray. And then uh, we'll give you all time to come down and we'll, um, we'll do the prayer list in just a moment. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time you've given us in, in your word. And pray that you please help us uh, with the desire to be separated unto you. Lord, thank you for giving us the ability, the power to just trust in you. And um, pray that you please help us to do that, Lord. Help us to trust. Help us to get rid of all the things that we... Uh, that we should not be doing in our lives, Lord Jesus. Help us to get rid of those. Help us to replace them with things that show the love of Christ. I love you, Lord, and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, before we do our prayer time, um, like I said, I just wanted to bring this up to you. Ms. Jackie did a lot of work, a lot of research into things to, to kind of show central and who we are. I just want to bring this up to you. Um, it's a men's T-shirt. It's a soft tee. And we have the opportunity to make an order of these T-shirts with our logo on them. And the thing is, uh, for the price that we got quoted, we have to order at least 24 of them. So I just want to get a feel for who wants one, and who's interested. Colors too, right? Yeah, different colors, different sizes. All they have to do, is they have to have that same logo on it. So let me see. And this is a men's size. Yeah, and, and she's on it. She's doing her, I want to do everything in the world before I have the baby thing. So this has probably happened like in four hours. So, Okay, so if we have at least 24, then they're going to be $15 a t-shirt. So it's a soft t-shirt. All right, so we got what, one, two. Hold your hands up so I just get a count, okay? One, two, three, four. Hey, that's like 24 in this room. All right, cool. Um, so we'll have like a sign up and y'all go ahead and... We'll do that later. It's not tonight, but we'll do that another time. Uh, probably this Sunday, well, this Sunday or Wednesday, probably this Sunday we'll have it out there. 
and we'll see who wants the shirt, and then we'll just take the number of people that said, hey, I want the shirt, and we'll put an order in. And then uh, they'll be here whenever they get done. And like Jackie was saying, we will have researched on the ladies' cut for however many details that needs to go on. I don't know, but she's all over it. So I appreciate you looking out for that. <laughs> all right, so thank you all for... Thank y'all for riding with us through the Bible. That was fun. And the pastor preached a good message. I think that Christ wants us to, to show his love more. Uh, one way that we show love more is praying for others. Um, make sure to lift each other up. So we already had a prayer list. I want to give the opportunity for everyone that wants to to come down to the altar so we can go ahead and pray for these needs that got brought up. And I wrote down about half a page more um, needs than were already on here. I hope you were keeping track of them as well. So we'll go ahead and give time for that. Uh, give it a few minutes and I'll come up and um, I will pray for the items on this list and y'all pray with me. So feel free. I'll pray in your seats or come down.
Lord, thank you for this time that you've given us, and thank you for helping us be together, helping us come here, and Lord, it's, it's hot outside, and Lord, it's sticky, and people are tired, but thank you for uh, putting the desire in, in these people's hearts to come to you and uh, come hear from your word. And thank you for the faithful folks that you've put on this world that have been saved by you and want to show your love. Lord, uh, there's people that are on our hearts, Lord, and we bring them up to you because we know that you have the power to answer these prayers, Lord Jesus. We're coming into your throne room, Lord, the, the, the room of the most powerful being in the universe, Lord Jesus, just to bring up these petitions to you. And, uh, Lord, it's not a light thing to come up to you, Lord, but thank you so much for this privilege that we can ask these requests of you. Thank you so much for your willingness to listen to just someone like me to bring these requests. So, Lord, um, we are... So we're having a, a lot of people with issues with their health, and Lord, uh, there's several that I want to bring up. And Miss um, Brown, Miss Debbie, she's uh, has surgery, Lord Jesus, and a rather complicated surgery for when it sounds like let's help the surgery and the recovery to go well. And uh, Lord, whatever kind of therapy or anything like that would be easy to manage. And uh, I think of Sandy Charnick as she's going through recovery uh, therapy right now. Uh, Miss Marcia. Uh, Miss Teresa, Barbara, um, they all have things that they're uh, battling, health issues that they're needing help with. Lord uh, Aaron, I'm going to bring him up for his health issues. Uh, let's have Miss Crystal, Lord Jesus, with her foot to continue, continue to heal. Um, Jesse's dad, uh, he's recovering, and Lord, I pray that you please help him just stay strong and, and to continue to heal. Uh, Big health, big health thing is Jackie and this baby. I pray that this baby would come uh, soon and this baby would come healthy and, and also recover be well. And, and Lord, it's just a miracle that you're bringing a brand new life into the world. And thank you for letting us, um, letting us be here to see that happen. Uh, Ryan Brown, how's nephew? I'm recovering from uh, health issues as well. Um, think of Ariana and Adriana, their mom, Melissa, she's sick and hurt her foot. I pray that you please help her to heal and recover from that. Um, again, another one, Lord. Um, Laura's baby, no thyroid, Lord Jesus. Uh, Going to have to take me medicine for the rest of her life. Lord, thank you so much for the wisdom that you've given doctors to know what to do. Lord, I pray that you please continue to steer them in the right direction to help the recommendations that actually work, Lord. Um, Lord, I just want to lift up some other things, Lord, too, as well. Uh, Vern, being on the road, give him safety. Uh, there's also people that need uh, spiritual needs, Lord. The Machins, uh, they need help making decisions. Lord, I pray that you please help us all to, uh, to just depend on your wisdom, Lord. The Bible says so much about wisdom, seeking wisdom, how valuable it is. Help us to get the knowledge and the understanding that we need from you, Lord. Lord, help our military. Help our military to know what to do, to know what's right for each individual, be able to know their freedoms and stand up for them. Lord, help our leaders. Um, there's so many people that have been appointed um, by our system of government, by the people, Lord Jesus, and we know that you can control what they do, Lord. You, your, your hand has the heart of the king in it, and you can turn that heart whithersoever you will. Lord, we pray that you please just turn our uh, turn our country towards the right direction, Lord. We heard about this meeting on the uh, 17th about the school board in Newport News making some really, really drastic decisions, Lord. I pray that you make those go the right way, Lord, and not the way that um, not the way the world wants them to go. But Lord, please keep righteousness in in your purview here, Lord. Thank you for uh, just thank you for your ability to see everything going on. I just want to praise you and lift you up. And Lord, uh, again, just be with us and help us to stay strong. Help us to show your love and help us to draw more people in uh, as you are living through us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All righty, well, thank you so much. I hope you take your prayer list home to keep it with you. And uh, we all can be dismissed. <laughs>